forging cyber, forging cyber security. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. Now, our free preview of Secure Ninja's online Sensei series has generated such a positive reaction that we've decided to give away every single module from this Cyber Kung Fu course, featuring Larry Greenblatt, Tom Upjagrove, and me. If you like what you see and would like to experience a Secure Ninja training course in person at any of our training locations, we have some amazing time-sensitive specials for you. Just visit secureninja.com specials for all of the do not miss deals. And now here is your free module from Cyber Kung Fu for the Certified Ethical Hacker version 8. Enjoy! Alright, let's recap where we are. So we have now finished the reconnaissance. So again, we, um, well, doing both passive and active reconnaissance, we've tried to identify people. We've identified machines. Um, using our scanning techniques, we were able to uh, make a guess or, or a of what the operating systems are and possibly the IP addresses of those machines. We identified, um, also with our scanner techniques, uh, our applications and, and possibly you know, the target apps uh, of, of servers and, and uh, other uh, client apps. Um, we have, uh, wow, an enumeration. We've even figured out, all right, well, if this, is a, uh, this application has to be a, a print share. What's the name of the printer? Uh, if this is a, uh, an authentication server, who are the users in there? If it's a mail server, what mail names are in there? All right, so uh, we've identified the people, the machines, and we did vulnerability scanning. What are they possibly vulnerable to? Now remember, the, a vulnerability just says uh, that something could go wrong. For example, my, my guitars, uh, being made of uh, primarily wood, are vulnerable to the threat of fire. But an exploit would really be burning the guitars. So that's where we are right now. We're going to actually now exploit these perceived vulnerabilities. Now, in the scope of a penetration test, uh, you would say this is validating the claimed vulnerability because you could do a vulnerability scan. I could run Nessus or something and say, oh, okay, these vulnerabilities are there. Um, but if anybody here has ever uh, run a vulnerability scanner, I'm sure you've seen a few false positives. In fact, the test knows that as well. And the best way to validate a claimed vulnerability is to actually exploit it. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, today, in this module, we're going to exploit password vulnerabilities for the most part. But really, the rest of the week and the rest of the course, we're going to be going through vulnerabilities in wireless. We'll exploit those. Vulnerabilities in firewalls. We'll exploit those. Vulnerabilities in web servers. We'll exploit those, right? SQL servers. Right now, we're going to focus on password cracking. Using um, a, an exploit of guessing the password and how to get into the system, I can now own the system. Well, maybe I came in as anonymous. I, get a, I want to get the root. So using the other techniques, I will escalate my privileges, grab the root, but I want to keep the root. So the way to keep the root is plant a back door in there, root kits. Um, I want to borrow something from a, a great author, Ed Scotus. Uh, so, if, Ed, you see this? Yes, you, you're the one who taught me this. Uh, Ed said that if you wanted to poison somebody, a virus is kind of like adding poison to their soup. So if I, well, if I had a virus detector, I'd say this ingredient here does not belong in soup. An application layer rootkit is a little trickier. I'm going to take a valid application, maybe Internet Explorer or something, and I remove it. And I put in a different one. That's like saying, instead of adding poison to the soup, I'm going to remove a potato, and then I'm going to replace that potato with a poisoned potato. And that's a little stealthier because there is supposed to be a potato in there. But if I check it, right, and uh, run a hash file against it or some integrity check, right, that's not the right, right potato. And I can get rid of that, and I put the real one back in. But a kernel-level rootkit would be like replacing your tongue. It wouldn't matter what they ate. So on a test, typically, if somebody uh, ever gets root level privileges, super user, they may call it admin, and backdoor a machine, the only way to really trust that machine again is to just scrub it, start all over, wipe the hard drive, and reinstall the operating system from some trusted source. 
In real life, I don't know. I really don't know, because, uh, you know, when I was a little boy, you wanted to upgrade somebody's bias, your firmware, right? It was a, your basic input operating system. You soldered in a chip, damn it. Then we had socketed chips. But then I remember coming out, well, they had EPROMs, and, you know, I never had an EPROM burner, but we had a guy at our place could do that. That was really cool. But then they came out with flash. And flash memory... And I remember just the thought of it then. Now, again, I'm a not work ops guy. I don't consider myself a hacker. I just manage to figure things out and make something cool happen now and then. Flash allows me to just software update this thing. And I remember it saying, uh, uh, wow, don't reboot your system during this update or else you can blow the system. Yeah, when we talk about denial of service attacks, I could send you a bad flash update. And they actually call that on this test flashing. Uh, Flashing is also known to brick the system because it's done. Now, I used to think of denial of service attack, something you can reboot from, but not that. But I, I wouldn't just brick a system. I don't want to break you. If I was um, want to take over the world or something, I would write uh, flash updates that, that just maintain backdoors. And I don't know too many uh, antivirus software that scan those things. Uh, and way outside the scope, I never hear anybody talk about this, but it really disturbs me, and maybe, maybe this will be coming. What Flash did for BIOS and firmware, field programmable gate arrays due to CPUs. For example, I have um, a couple of Asus Minis. Uh, they have the Intel Atom processor. It's an FPGA, and it phones home every time I reboot. Uh, I know their home is actually in Taiwan, but the factories are in China. And so, and again, every time my machine boots up, it says, is there any updates to this stuff? I'm just saying, if I wanted to take over the world, I would say, yeah, I have some updates for you. So I don't know. On a test, though, scrub the system. In real life, the only thing I trust, I'm a packet-sniffing guy. I don't trust this machine. I need to monitor it. You can't prevent everything, guys. Security is about prevention, detection, and response. I need an IDS watching what this is saying. It's the only way I'm going to trust. All right, but let's uh, hit the uh, test objectives here. All right, so we're going to combine uh, modules uh, 5, 6, and 7 uh, because, it, well, module 5 really includes planning in a backdoor, some type of Trojan. We can go into those details all in one module. So we've gained access, right? Now, I can gain access many different ways. Uh, anybody here ever, um, you, you turn on your laptop, maybe at a hotel, and you see somebody else is sharing their media center or something like that? It's weird. Yeah, because Microsoft, to make it easy to build a browse list, um, will always advertise some things. And let me bring up my, my uh, Explorer here and show you what I'm talking about. If I say I'm supporting uh, file and print sharing, then it's going to advertise out. Yeah, he's got files and, and printers ready to be shared. So that's why I turn off the, the uh, client from uh, Microsoft Networks and file and print sharing because I'm not doing that. And I don't want that being advertised out there. Now, when we crack uh, passwords, um, think about it. Most people have a policy that says after three unsuccessful attempts, um, disable the password. Most or disable login. Most people do not crack passwords online because of that. But these passwords are stored somewhere in the system. They're stored in some encrypted or hashed database. Once I'm in, even as anonymous, or in Microsoft, you might see the null user account. Uh, I have the ability to grab that that same database, that that uh, hashed file database. Now I could take that file home and start doing my offline attack. So again, we're not cracking passwords very much online, but if I can get that database, take it home, see if I can crack it offline, and you're not going to notice. All right? So uh, we're going to exploit the vulnerabilities we found, and it starts with bypassing normal authentication. Typically, authentication is done with a password or some token device or maybe a biometric, and we'll discuss these a little bit uh, just to give you a, some background on it. Uh, but mostly what we're focused on is the password in this module. All right, once I've uh, I gained access, I'm going to get the root. So if I came in as anonymous and I cracked the admin account, now I'm, now I'm administrator. I want to maintain that. So I'll probably create another account name. 
Um, I wouldn't call it Bob either. Personally, uh, you'll, you'll see the term maybe um, in studies of a fictitious subscriber. So an attacker uh, plants in some accountant and you do some um, inventory and you go, wow, Bob, do we have a Bob who works here? No, he pay. but I wouldn't call it Bob. I would take a look at your service accounts and I'd see how you name those. An SVC Exchange Store or something like that. And I'd make something that looked just like it. Yeah, very close. All right, and then they want to hey, give this guy root level, maintain it. And um, sometimes that means planning in tools like those root kits. Now, a root kit doesn't give you root privileges, but once you have root, it allows you to maintain it. And they frequently come with other tools. So a really handy thing would be a sniffer. Now, a sniffer, if it's running, uh, and we'll see this in our sniffing module, uh, will be in what's known as promiscuous mode. And I ask it, are you in promiscuous mode? Well, not my root kit version. It's not going to reply a, a, a right answer. Normally, PS command says yes. Um, no, it's not. So they're going to give you rooted versions of tools to lie to you. So you're not getting honest answers from this machine. Well, these root kits, they're all built on those old, you know, started with viruses. Um, these are malicious code. And the terms now really blend. So let's just break it down very simple. Any of these malicious code, malware, viruses, worms, trojans, have a payload. This is the evil thing it's going to do. And some way to deliver or deploy that payload. And we'll just go over uh, a number of ways to deploy those payloads. And then finally, uh, attackers cover their tracks. You want to remove any uh, evidence that you were there. Now on the test, I've seen you scrub the logs. Personally, I think that that would send a huge alert. Let's say I broke in between uh, 1 and 2 in the morning on a Sunday, and all of a sudden, the log runs all the time, but there's no events between 1 and 2. That's going to send. So I would rather find out what a normal 1 between 1 and 2 on Sundays looks like and populate it with bogus events. Right? That'd be one way I'd cover my tracks. All right, so how do I really know that when Bob says he's Bob, that it's Bob? So when you claim to be somebody, uh, you may hear in, in security circles, that's known as being a claimant. I claim. I've identified myself as Larry. How can I validate that claimed identity? And there are three basic ways we do that. Something you know, the password. Something you have, my car keys or whatever, my room key, my, my, my driver's license. Or something I are or do. Something I are, something I am or do. Um, many people think that a biometric is what you are, but that's not exactly a problem. Let's take a look at the board here. The most common biometric in the world is a signature. That is not what I are or, or do. Sorry, I get that from a John Legend song. What kind of a girl you think I are? Kind of you meet in a bar? Anyway, no, I'm sorry. Uh, now, if you're a good artist, you might be able to copy that signature. So a smarter way to do this is to have a dynamic signature detector. And dynamic would measure how long did it take me. Right? So we got to think of time. Many people don't consider um, you know, how time works. We measure time two ways. If I'm driving down the street and I get a flat, I need to pull over to the side of the road where I can change a tire, a safe place. Then I need to change my tire. But I don't have another spare, so I'm not really out of the emergency until I get my original tire replaced or repaired. All right, so I had the flat state. I had the safe state. I had the recovered state. I can drive a little bit. Covered. And then when I return to normal, I'm reconstituted. Reconstituted. But there were processes to get that done. I had to... Uh, you know, drive to the side of the road, find a safe place, look like I put a jack. I have to know how to put on a spare tire. I have to know how to shop for the best type of tire. So we measure time in both state, a point in time, these are states, and in process, how do I move from state to state? Because they come from the Greek. It means to proceed. All right, so um, a dynamic signature detector would measure the process and say, Larry normally takes uh, a much less time to write his hand. You, you may have made the outcome look like that. So a static, when you see something as static, that means it doesn't respect time. UDP is a static protocol. Um, when I use a, a router to create a, an access control list, it's static, it's open or it's not. But a checkpoint created a stateful firewall. TCP is a stateful protocol. We know what point in time. So it's very important that we consider state 
and, and process. So again, a dynamic signature detector would hold more information about the subject and would be harder to spoof or masquerade as. Um, some biometrics are a combination of both. My voice is a combination of part of the way that my body's shaped, uh, but part of it I can change. So where my signature is purely at will, that's what I do, my iris is something what I am. I can't focus and make my eye look different, uh, but my voice is a hybrid. Uh, the more something is what you do, the more dynamic it is in general. So it's going to change over my lifetime. Um, the more sad it, my iris hasn't changed much in life. All right, now, not really testable anywhere I heard, but I read this in an RSA white paper and I liked it a lot. What about someone you know? And when you think about it, like you pass a test, you get certified, but how'd you get the job? Probably somebody you knew. And I have this little quote in there, it's not what you know, but who, because of something that happened when I was a little kid. And I used to say, uh, it's not very politically correct, but when I was young, growing up in the neighborhood, we said there were two ways to get out of North Philly. One way was to join the service. The other way is to get some girl pregnant whose dad's in a union. And his, he's going to hook you up. And a buddy of mine did. I'm washing dishes for two thirty-five an hour, and one of my buddies comes up in the corner wearing a three-piece suit. And he goes, see, Greeny, Mr. Smarty Pants? He's making six fifty an hour. It ain't what you know, it's who you know. But he's right. When we get into encryption, and we talk about private-public key pairs, I can create a private-public key pair. I could show you a tool right now. It's called Crypt Tool create it, give the public key out, and write, my name is Barack Obama. When we get into encryption, the big challenge in asymmetric encryption is validating this. I need a trusted third party to say. The reason you wouldn't trust is because you're looking for like VeriSign or Deutsche Telekom to create a hash of this and using their private key encrypt the hash and they signed your public key. Um, but who is that trusted third party? And uh, I'll, I'll read it this morning in crypto, but to me, uh, well, the two basic ways you're going to see on any test are either PGP, where your homeboy digitally signs that, or PKI, where a certificate authority like VeriSign. And I like to think that SPOC prefers PKIs very orderly. You know, it's what the Federation wants us to do. But Kirk would probably be a little more suspicious and he'd be like, SPOC, I've never met VeriSign. But if Flanagan from the Intrepid signed that key, he's a good man. So I don't know that one's better. It really depends on your needs. So uh, that's why I have to have someone you know. The web of trust is what Kirk is using. He knew Flanagan. That's PGP, and someone's going to sign it. Um, but uh, most of the time, a test is going to cover PKI, where Vera signs some ISO-approved uh, certificate authority. But we're going to have much more time to explore that in encryption. All right. <clears throat> so... The most common type, and I consider it the unshielded twisted pair of authentication. So if biometrics are the most secure, that's like fiber optic. Um, unshielded twisted pair is the least secure cable, that's like, you know, passwords. And consider your return on investment. Would you tell your boss we should throw out all the unshielded twisted pair and replace it with fiber optic? No, because if it, I can solve that problem with, with my unshielded twisted pair, if it works in this, it's a lot cheaper. Passwords are not wrong. They just have their issues. There are times that are appropriate. When you're in the office and I can see your face, password's probably fine. Anytime somebody's remoting in from home, I want more than just passwords because I can't see who you are. But passwords should be very secure. They are, they're basically encryption. It's a symmetric key. So let's look how passwords are supposed to look versus the, what we actually get. All right, so... In theory, and then let's uh, start with a keyword known as entropy. Entropy, scientists would say, is the measure of randomness or chaos in a system. But for us as, as uh, digital security people, we're going to say entropy is the number of values I can have given the number of bits. Very simple. I have one bit. That bit is either going to be, I'm thinking of a number, it's either a one or a zero. If you have one bit of entropy, you have an entropy of two. It's either going to be zero or one. But if I had two bits, that number could have been zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. So I have four bits. I, uh, two bits of entropy gives me, uh, two, it gives me four. Three will give me eight. Four, 16. 32, 
64, 128, 256. When I type in a character on a computer, it is stored eight bits at a time. I have a range of numbers that it could be, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way through 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And those numbers are, all zeros would be 0, and all 1s is 255. So you would say 8 bits of entropy provides 256 possible values. So if I typed in a uh, password of one character, you have a 1 in 256 chance of guessing that password. No, not really. Most people will only use alpha text. So you just reduce the entropy to 26. There's only 26 letters in our alphabet. All right, upper and lower. 52. Upper, lower, numeric, special characters. The entire ASCII key set was written on 7 bits. And there are non-printable characters, so you don't even get 128. I don't think too many people are putting carriage return in their password. So there's a big challenge. Now, when they built computers and we were storing things at 8 bits, that, uh, this 8th bit was parity for error detection. But IBM decided, the PC, to give you a separate chip. So they, they actually extended the ASCII key set. So you could actually, if the system supports it, increase your entropy. Let's take a look at that. Extended ASCII key set was created by IBM. And and there's a nice image for it. And extent 128 looks like that. Anybody here put that in your password? Not too many people even know how to do that. If a system supports it, and Microsoft does, I could, let's see, that says 128, and it looks like that's C. Now, I have a number pad on my laptop. If you don't have a number pad, you'll probably have to use your function key. But I hold down the Alt, and I put in 128, and I get that character. Cool, cool. Um, not everybody supports it. Actually, it's kind of funny. I uh, use TrueCrypt to encrypt my uh, a drive. This Here, I just use a, a particular file. When I first got TrueCrypt, I wanted to try it on a laptop. I encrypt the whole disk. And the, um, the GUI front end that came at Windows allows me to put in an extended ASCII character. Excellent. And then it boots up with a DOS loader that doesn't. So the second time I encrypted my hard drive, I decided not to do that. Uh, but Microsoft does support it. And it's kind of funny. Years ago, I had a, um, I was like my first class I ever taught. I was a consultant, but at night I got to teach. And it's Windows 3.5.1, it's the mid-90s. And a, a guy comes back from some conference and he says, hey, if you really want to increase the entropy of your, um, your password, use upper, lower, numeric, special characters, and extended ASCII. And he showed me if I put in Alt 255, it's a blank. And he said, it's kind of like security through obscurity, but even if the guy could reveal your password, he might not see it. So he says, put that at the end, right? All right, so I'm teaching for a company called Icon. And their, their initials were actually, it's an acronym. It stood for I Know One Name. And I was going to teach a class for them, and I wanted to make a password that I would remember, but we use those rules. So I went, all right. E, lowercase, Y, E, ampersand, special characters, capital K, zero, lowercase n, and then alt, two, five, five. So my password is this. And on Wednesday, a student says, Dan, what's your password? Excuse me? Hey, did you ever see Lovecrack? No. He had been running Lovecrack, a tool you'll use in your lab uh, for this module. He had been using Lovecrack, and he said, I had everybody's password Monday morning by 10, except for yours. Guys, this is what I still use for everything. It's a good password. I would use it if I were No, no, obviously. Um, but actually, um, it's not perfect. Uh, I'll go into this in much more detail, but one of my favorite uh, password crackers uh, and hackers in general is Megumi Takshita. She runs IQ Network Services out of Japan. 
um, author of uh, uh, 20 more books, uh, including the Wireshark user manuals. And she told me when WPA2 came out that she could crack it on an average of um, three and a half minutes. And I said, I think you're talking about web. And she said, no, Larry son, WPA2. I said, but WPA2 uses AES encryption. It's, it's, it's cleared to secret and above in some cases. AES very strong, Larry son. But if your passphrase is not a random number, you have reduced entropy. This is not a random number. Now, this is already a syllable. On your test, you might see this as a syllable attack. This one cracked me up. She said, Larry son, you are not the only person to think of number zero instead of letter zero. Really, I thought I made that up. Anyway, so, yeah, it's, it's better uh, having extended ASCII. I have increased the randomness, but it's really not random. So how can I get a true random password? I can get a random password generator. Yeah, and what will the user do with that? Tape it to the bottom of the keyboard because they're not going to remember it. Passwords can be great mathematically. It's the humans that mess it up, and that's the challenge. All right, so let's take a look at some of our password attacks. So um, if a password itself uh, it doesn't give me enough entropy unless I make up a random number, and if I make up a random number, I've got to write it down, why don't you just make a long word, a passphrase? That's pretty debatable to people, though. Passphrases supposedly would give me a, a much more, uh, um, well, it would give me the same entropy by making it longer, but a much easier phrase to, for me to remember so I won't write it down. Um, but according to Bruce Schneier, that's not necessarily true. It's kind of like playing Wheel of Fortune. So if I see a Q, guess what's coming next? I don't know. Uh, so I've done some research. And there's a lot of debate. I don't want to say one versus the other. I did look at Diceware, and um, where you, you roll dice to generate the passphrase. It looks pretty kind of cool. Um, with, it's a random phrase. And I don't know what I would do with a random phrase. Uh, may I mambo dog face to the banana patch? I might write it down. But usually that gets very good reviews. So. All right, uh, there are technical problems. Not everybody supports a strong password. Um, last time I checked, American Express still did not support uh, even my um, uh, special characters. It's, it's upper, lower, and a number. And so, well, knowing, you know, don't use the same password, so make it longer. I made it longer. Uh, don't write it down because that's considered bad practice, and I don't remember it. Uh, well, that's okay, because they have a password recovery system. It's known as the cognitive password. Now, cognitive passwords are fact or opinion-based information. You know, uh, what's your favorite color? But the most common thing is what's your mother's maiden name? And at that point, that's what it was. And why, who besides Larry would know his mother's maiden name? So when I enrolled, I didn't really give him my mother's maiden name. Uh, I uh, put something else down that I didn't write down. Every time I need to get America Express, I have to make a phone call. You don't know your mother's maiden name? Is it Romulan Bird of Prey? Close. Klingon Battle Cruiser? Yes, Mr. Greer. So it's tough. So technologies don't always support it. And then we have other issues in, in the humans. Operational problems, right? We, probably the worst thing. Some people share them, but to me the worst thing is reusing them. So if you really want to get somebody's strong password, and I'm borrowing this from uh, Bruce Schneier, offer something for free on the internet and require strong authentication. They will probably use their favorite password. Uh, so it's tough. All right, so how can we crack them? We said uh, online, um, most likely that's not going to work. After three unsuccessful logins, blah, blah, blah. So we generally grab that file offline, and that's what you're going to do in your labs. You're going to grab the um, Microsoft SAM database and take it offline. Now, the SAM has grown over a few years. Uh, originally, they used uh, DES as a hashing tool. DES can only encrypt seven, bits at a, uh, seven characters, I said, 56 bits at a time. Well, if I put in eight bits per character, you're only getting a seven character password. So if I make an eight character password, they created another hash of that, and it really was not like 256 times stronger. I didn't add really eight bits of entropy. I just had two seven character passwords to crack. So that was really a bad mistake, and they fixed that. Um, in Windows 2000, they made it better, but for downward compatibility, they still supported Landman but from Vist and above, that's disabled. So no more seeing that anymore. Dictionary attacks, um, when I first heard them, I, was, I thought of Webster's Dictionary. Now, uh, another th thing Megumi did, she cracked a, uh, we're, we're teaching for a company, she cracked her password, uh, their passphrase for me, in eight seconds. And I said, how did you do that? She said, a simple dictionary attack, very son. I said, but their name, it was the name of the company, plus one, two, three. And she goes, 
I said, their name is not a dictionary word. I use your website for dictionary. Oh. See, dictionaries don't have to be Webster's. Um, since then, I've had plenty of uh, military uh, red team pen testers, some of my best uh, pen testers. And they said, if I went to break into you, Larry, I would find you on LinkedIn. I would find you on um, uh, whatever, Facebook. I would find your favorite movies. I would find your favorite books, your favorite music. And that would be fed in to my dictionary. And I was like, ooh, then you would have me. Actually, it's kind of interesting, too, when um, uh, Megumi did it because they had a good upper and lower and, and the numeric. And I said, but, you know, they, they make, you know, most people you tell them make uh, upper and lower, they will just make first letter uppercase. You tell them most people um, must add number, they will wait to the end, make one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. So there are rules that we, we follow just as humans that we think we're being crafty, but we're not. So uh, a dictionary attack, again, I'm looking for some well-known words, but I can make up my own dictionary. And, um, well, this would be better than brute forcing. The whole point of, of the idea is to not brute force. So let's step back again. I've got a bicycle lock, and this bicycle lock has four wheels, 10 positions each. The entropy of this system is 10 to the fourth, which would be 10,000. So in theory, you would have to try 5,000 numbers before the odds are even 50-50. And if my processing speed is a thousand numbers an hour, um, then you'd say after five hours, the system is good on average, about five hours. I wouldn't trust it for more than that. But most bicycle locks don't provide that type of entropy because when you get the first number right, the lock will get looser. So that's a side channel attack. We didn't brute force it. All right, and I'd say classic Joe Lewis martial arts concept. He said, never come straight at a guy. When you come straight at a guy, the bigger, faster, stronger guy wins. But if I can get you looking one way and I'm coming the other way, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I heard a really funny side channel attack on the History Channel where they have these things and it's like, you know, you're just Civil War reenactors, whatever. They get these guys, they reenact. Uh, one guy studies um, um, ninjutsu and is like, who could be a ninja or a Spartan? And actually, guys that study this. And the Spartan goes on and talks about his weaponry and their training methods. And they question the ninja. He goes, yeah, but that's if I met him head on. I would just wait till he fell asleep, stab him in his sleep. So that's a side channel attack. You don't meet the math head on. Here's another uh, side channel attack they did on early password systems. The password is Fred. All right. Try A. You reject it, but how long did it take? Two milliseconds. B, two milliseconds. C, you get to F, four milliseconds. G, two, F, four. All right, F's, F, A, F, B. Early password systems used to reject you on the first wrong character. That turned out to be a horrible idea. All right, so now everybody knows to parse the entire password. But maybe because of Microsoft saying, oh, well, we're going to hash things seven characters at a time, they made an eight-character password, a dictionary the first seven characters, and I just brute forced the last character. So a hybrid is uh, some mixture. The fact that I used a number zero instead of a letter zero. Right? Rule-based is the fact that people knew I had to change everything for Star Trek. I had to remove all my Star Trek uh, related systems, uh, because people know Larry loves Star Trek. Now, here's another big issue in hashing. And first, let me just show you what a hash works, so put this in context. I'm going to create a very simple file. Let me make sure it's not here, DL star.txt. I'm going to create a very simple file, notepad uh, hash test.txt. Uh, yes, I'll create that, and I create a very simple file. All right, so there's my, um, my password, so to speak. And I'm going to create a hash of this, md5 sum space hash. And I get some 128-bit value. Now, if you know that somebody's only going to create, and there's my train going, John, you love it? Uh, it's there for me. It's there for me. And once it makes me want to play some Johnny Cash. Um, now that uh, we know the passwords may be no longer than, say, eight characters, couldn't I possibly create a list of every eight character combination and create a hash of all that? Yeah. So if you always hash just the password, you're going to be vulnerable to a particular attack, a pre computed hash value. Microsoft is vulnerable to that. How can I counter that? Let's go back into the notepad and don't just hash the password. I'll say whatever, plus something. 
plus, when I add something to something, I'm adding a salt, plus some salt. Uh, now when I hash this, I don't get the same number. So if somebody creates a, a database of hashes and they didn't salt the password, like Microsoft, you could create a list of every, say, seven, then eight character password, and nine character password. Now, you're gonna get kind of big, but I understand with like 30 gigs, you're pretty safe to get pretty much every eight character password or more. Um, and Microsoft is very vulnerable to those, and they're known as the rainbow tables attack, pre-computed hash values. But because Linux will salt your passwords, they're not as vulnerable. Um, way outside the scope of this is determining what did they use for the salt. So that's something much more advanced, uh, but you'd be doing something called salt guessing. Did they use your full name? Did they use the time and date you created it? Uh, all right, so again, for your test, you got dictionary attacks, you have hybrid attacks, rule-based when you know something about the individual. Uh, rainbow tables are pre-computed hash values. And um, know that land manager, Microsoft old land man, only has seven characters at a time. So very vulnerable to uh, a number of attacks. Um, Passwords also get cracked over the wire, too. Let's see how passwords have evolved over the wire. Because this is when you're logging in locally. The very first password authentication protocol I know of, when we first were able to get IP over some remote connection line, and that was an RS-232 port, all right, the serial port, we had slip. And to make sure that that person dialing in was really who they said they were, we prompted them for a password, and that password was uh, done with the Password Authentication Protocol, or PAP. And PAP, bad. Because PAP would send the password from Bob to the authentication server in clear text, and Eve is eavesdropping. Don't use PAP. And a guy comes up with a great idea. Hey, boss, we already know Bob. We have him listed over here. Yeah. Yeah, and we already know his password. Now, we know it's hashed, but for simplicity, we'll just say his password is eagle. Okay, Bob. All right, so when Bob logs in, don't send his password over. Just send Bob over in clear text. And they look him up and they go, oh, his password's Eagle. Salt that password. So they add some number to it, some number. And they hash the two. Now, it would have been an earlier hashing algorithm, but since you need to know MD5, I'll do it with MD5. So they run MD5 against Eagle in this number, just as I did, and you get some 128-bit value. Great. Now. Challenge Bob to do the same thing. Bob, if it's really you, would you take this number, enter your password, yeah, salt your password with this number, hash the two together, uh-huh, uh, sure, get some 128-bit value, and send that. See, boss, all we just checked to see is that these are the same. But we never actually sent the password in clear text. Brilliant, brilliant. And what does Eve do? Eve says, hi, I'm Bob. She saw that in clear text before. And they say, oh yeah, it's really you. Take this number, add it to your password, Sultan hashes, you can nah, ask okay. I'll just play back what I saw Bob say the last time. Encrypting passwords does not matter. Not if you always accept the same encrypted version of it. They'll just replay that. And these are typically hashed, so it's very commonly called passing the hash. Let's take a look at that. Passing the hash attack. Yeah, still happening. Still, many years later, they're still going on. Um, and I have three million hits. Now, uh, let's just take that attack out, actually even get more. And uh, still passing the hash, 15 years later. 
This is nine million hits. And I think if we scroll down, there's probably gonna be stuff that's not really security related, but maybe Grateful Dead related. Uh, what they re did was replay what they saw the last time. So it's also a replay attack, right? Again, it doesn't matter if you encrypt a password, if you always accept the same value, they'll just replay it. So the way to mitigate this are my three favorite things in math when it comes to security, and people miss it all the time. Fundamental problem here. This number cannot be used over and over again. We can only use that number once. A nonce is a number that you only use once. They are very important in security, and people miss it all the time. All right, don't use the same number, and Eve's listening, and there was 22. I'll bet you the next one's 23. No, they have to be randomly generated, and as you go to write that, some nerd goes, there's no such thing as a random number generator. It's always a pattern. I don't know if that's exactly true there, tough guy, but it would take infinity to prove that, so as Kirk would say, is it random enough? But on a test, we call those pseudo random number generators. But let's imagine, I'm gonna borrow this from one of my favorite authors in security, Ross Anderson. He authored uh, Security Engineering. And he said, imagine this is your bank and they give you a key. They have a copy. What you're to do with the number is to encrypt it with the key and send it back. All right, so Eve saw Bob's name. She goes to the bank, says, hi, I'm Bob. And they give her the number. Bob is, uh, Eve has inferred that Bob's an Eagles fan. So she sets up an Eagles fan page. Um, actually, this week, there may have been a wardrobe malfunction with one of the cheerleaders, free video downloads. Bob goes to her site. Oh, may I see? Oh, who is this? It's Bob, I'm a member. Bob, if it's really you, would you take this number I have, encrypt it with that key and send it back to me? And then she plays it back. But she tried to get into the bank Monday morning. He didn't go to her website till Thursday. What is a reasonable time between username and password? 30 seconds, a minute? So the next most important thing are timeouts. That's why you yell at the kids, shut the door. I know you needed to go in and out, but I don't need the heat to go in and out. I don't need the insects to go in and out. These are our three most important things. Um, so this is what they did in the updated version of our encrypted password, sometimes called MS uh, Chap. Microsoft did this. Uh, sometimes called Chap V2. But Chap V2 is a much better way to handle passwords. They salt your password uh, with a nonce that is pseudo-randomly generated, and you only have a little bit of time to enter it else or else it won't accept it again. That's a great thing. And we don't just use it there. Uh, RSA Secure ID. Right? If you've seen these token devices, they produce numbers that are only used once. They are pseudo-randomly generated, and you get about a minute. Right? They're generated every 30 seconds, but you have a minute to put it in. So, very important thing, and we see people uh, mess it up all the time. What if I'm not using passwords? Be careful, guys. See it all the time. PAP, clear text passwords. CHAP or CHAP v2 encrypted passwords, but we're not using just passwords. Please understand how the extensible authentication protocol works. And we're going to talk more about that later, but EAP, uh, particularly when we get to wireless. But EAP is when I'm not just doing passwords. And we have a number of ways to handle this. So 802.1x is EAP over LANs as opposed to over a serial connection. All right, so uh, token devices would be another way I could authenticate. So again, like my RSA Secure ID, it is a one-time password generator. What's the value of a one-time password generator? They're invulnerable to replay attacks. That's the whole point, All right? Sometimes you'll see it on the test as OTP, one-time password. Uh, but the key to the one-time password is uh, replay protection. Also, when we get into, uh, and they actually cover it in the official uh, chapters, in session hijacking, I prefer to cover it uh, in crypto again, um, but IPsec is not just for virtual private networks, guys. 
IPsec salts every packet with a nonce. IPsec in and of itself provides anti-replay protection. Another big problem with authentication. I use the memory card to prove who I am to the bank. Well, somebody could have stolen my card. Got to know the PIN, two-factor. And that proves that it's me. And some of the biggest, in fact, I understand still the number one way to rob a bank is to have a, a magnetic stripe reader at the bank, a skimming attack, and that's because we forgot something we knew as children. When I learned to use a phone, and I remember being all excited, Bell Tell created these little booklets you got in second grade or something. I couldn't wait because I saw my sisters got one. You learned a protocol that said, hi, this is me. Who may I ask is calling? We validated both ends and we forgot to do that on the internet. The reason skimming attacks work is because I'm only authenticating myself. How do I know that's my ATM? Those of you with smart cards, that's the value of the smart card. I almost never hear anybody say it right. I just listened to somebody on the radio uh, the other day talking about how we need to update the, the bank systems today, that we use memory cards. And when they were trying to explain to the news, uh, well, because it, it'll do chip and pin. It's stronger. I don't need to hear. You know the real difference? I don't just prove me. I know it's my bank. Uh, it's, it's called mutual authentication. IPsec provides mutual authentication as well. So IPsec is not just VPNs. It provides integrity, it provides anti-replay protection, it provides mutual authentication, and it provides confidentiality. All right, uh, type three authentication, something you are or do. Now I've said a number of times, you can't measure everything. And it's just impossible to measure everything, but uh, legally, like if I want to log, I can't measure um, HIPAA data. I'm not allowed to log your HIPAA data. So there's legal issues, there's technical issues. Now let's look at my, my uh, biometric. I'm gonna try and measure something about Larry. And um, the first time the authentication server knows me, I have, a, my eye looks like this. But Larry went to, uh, well, hypothetically, had a few beers at lunch. A little bloodshot. That's not Larry. Larry didn't look like that. You can't measure everything or else you're going to be vulnerable to what's uh, called a false reject. Right? So let's look at the slides here for a second. If this was my thumb and you measured too much about my thumb and I cut it, this system would be vulnerable to a type 1 or false reject. But if you don't measure enough detail about the thumb, hey, he's got a thumb, that must be Larry, then you're vulnerable to a type two or a false accept. Now, in operation, I don't know anybody who has, uh, would tolerate a false accept. So they tune, there's a, we live with a couple of type ones and what well, we have zero tolerance for false reject. But when you purchase one, you look for when they set that number to be equal in any test lab. So say, oh, we had uh, we tested a thousand people. We had ten type ones and no type twos. All right, back off. Uh, all right, we have six type twos, but we only have four type one. All right, make more detail. We just got five and five. Put that rating on the box, and you would say that that system provides a crossover error rate of five. Crossover error rates are not how you tune it. It's just a, a ranking, so you know how to purchase something. Now, try to get a, a fingerprint uh, on a uh, mechanic. So I had a student said he had to do the, uh, the authentication system, the biometric systems for the helicopter pilots, or actually the helicopter mechanics at the White House. And he said they went fingerprint, but it didn't work. So they went iris scan. Um, I notice a lot of times on tests they show you the level of uniqueness or whatever, but my experience is it's really operations. Uh, people argue, but a fingerprint's only unique to one in a um, hundred billion, but uh, an iris is unique to one in ten trillion. Guys, there are only six or seven billion people on earth. That's not the issue. It's some other operational issue. And one other final thing that I, I, I again, I got to borrow from Schneier. Um, in movies, they always attack the reader. So if this is the authentication service and it has a reference of what my eye looks like and says Larry equals this, that's his eye. In the movie, they get a phony contact lens. Maybe even they cut out my eye. But they don't send my eye over to the reader. They send ones and zeros. If Eve sniffs out my password, I can change it. What will I do when she sniffs out my eye? I mean, there, there 
salted or encrypted. Do we ever break encryption? No. These are the things that concern me. Uh, actually, I was kind of really spooked out. I was uploading pictures to Facebook, and uh, they got really good in their AIs and so on. Hey, is that Doug? Wow. And I tell you, I don't consider myself that bright, so I figure if I'm thinking it, there's got to be at least 100 other people thinking it. I'll bet it'd be cool to create a database of viruses. Yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm sure the top 100 governments and, and crime syndicates are building all kinds of stuff like that. All right, now that we've got it, we've grabbed the root, we want to maintain it, we're going to plant our back doors, we're going to create our rogue accounts, uh, the fictitious subscriber. The root kit does not give you root privileges, it helps you maintain it, and then you want to cover your tracks. Now, this malicious code uh, started for me in a book uh, called Neuromancer by William Gibson. Uh, it was written in 1984, um, it, it, amazing uh, stuff that he, he uh, came up with. Uh, he actually coined the term uh, cyberspace. Um, so in 1984, William Gibson envisioned a world, and, and keep in mind that uh, my, my friends uh, were like, why do you have a computer, Greeny? What am I ever gonna do with a computer in my house? Come on. But he envisioned a world where, where you know, most civilized people did have a computer. And they actually went to work that way. The legitimate operators were just working in computers. And it's like, wow. I think I had a four-user Starland Novell network sharing a five-meg hard drive and an Epson FX80 printer, and I thought, wow, you know. Uh, but the millions of people, and all work in there. Uh, but not everybody was working, so people were up to no good. You had petty criminals, you had corporate espionage, you had, you know, government uh, thing, and they would create, uh, I remember the first time I ever heard of, like, an intrusion detection system was actually called ICE, and this uh, intrusion countermeasure electronics, really weird. But then they invented software that would infect other software a computer virus, and I was like, that there's crazy Tolkien. Then in like 87, I believe it was, there was uh, some Indian fellows that had, had, had created a virus and got all this press, and anytime you went to fix someone's computer, they, do you think it's a virus? And you're like, no, I don't think it's a virus. Um, but then, uh, for me, it was kind of funny. The first one I saw was the form, um, but the b better one was uh, stoned. Stoned displayed a marijuana leaf on your machine. It says, your PC has been stoned, legalized marijuana. And you delete it, and it would show back up. It was embedded in the boot sector of the hard drive. So the only way to get rid of it, we would tell people, because it's too much labor, just, just wipe it and start over. But we actually had a guy who told us, if you had an IBM AT 30 meg hard drive, and so did you, they're both form of DOS 3.2, they're both as a 30 meg, you might be able to go in and debug, copy his partition, put it over there, but you better back everything up. And a guy comes in, he gives me a CD, or a three and a half inch floppy, I say, he goes, McAfee antivirus, dude. Make a copy of this, you won't have to go to debug. So it's a bootable disk. And then it was around 91, and I was at Wang Laboratories, emergency meeting, everybody. We had company blessed McAfee, uh, you know, uh, licensed copies. We were to scan all of our customers because, look at the Wall Street Journal. The Michelangelo virus was gonna delete your hard drive on the anniversary of Michelangelo's birthday. Um, Robert Morris Jr. The son of uh, Robert Morris Sr., you may have guessed. No, but uh, Robert Morris Sr. was the head of the NCSC, the National Computing Security Center, a division of the NSA. Uh, Junior, uh, the official story goes, and I don't know him, I don't know what to say, but uh, that he wanted to see how many users were on the internet. And exploiting um, uh, finger and send mail, he wrote a utility that would have mail servers enumerate users, and then he brought down 10% of the internet at that time. What bro? And it was different because the viruses that we were used to would attach itself to a program, and when you executed that program, it spread. And generally, it was with a floppy, you know. You're not. But his software understood network protocols, was self-contained, spread on its own. Wow. To give you an idea how quickly it spread, um, SQL Slammer spread something like 55 million hosts per second. That's pretty amazing. Um, how do I get you to really install? Like now, uh, through your, the rest of your labs, you're going to have rat builders. You're going to have Trojan builders and virus builders. But how would you get somebody to run it? You, you wouldn't say, here, run this thing. It's called evil code. No, I'll have you run something that looks good, right? Something cool. I got a great utility. I have a free software. I have an app for my phone. And it gives you something. But I had more. That's the Trojan. So again, if malware has a payload, What's the delivery mechanism or the replication mechanism? Viruses attach themselves to a host. Worms spread on their own. Trojans trick a user into thinking they're getting something and they get something else. And we know the rootkit will help you maintain root privileges.
The logic bomb was, uh, for me, was like the Michelangelo virus on the anniversary of his birth. Uh, uh, but I worry, um, I I'm very paranoid and I'm a sniffer guy. Anytime I get something in my house with an IP address, I start sniffing it. And when, you know, your refrigerator's got an IP address, why? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Uh, but my DVD players now have them and I'm sniffing them. And so far I've seen nothing, but I'm like, I don't know, maybe they're waiting for a certain day or when they send this code. All right, so when we did port scanning, remember, I can't scan for everything. Suppose, this is an old concept, suppose I was going to have this malware listen on port 6000, but it, when you scan it and send a SIN, it doesn't work because you can't just do that. You have to first send an unsolicited FIN to port 5000. Then you have to do a, uh, an ACK to whatever, 7000. And then you have to do an urge push in a FIN to 5000, which will dynamically open up 6000. And that's known as port knocking, very dangerous, not something I'd worry about for the test, but in real life, a big concern. Now these viruses have grown up, they talk to each other, they're now networked. And these uh, botnets have gotten ridiculously big. The largest botnet I know of, uh, they believe it was 30 million uh, mach infected machines at the time. Um, and they continue to grow. Zeus, up until Zeus, uh, botnets I always thought of as, um, uh, as doing denial of service tax or maybe spam sources. But we're going to talk about Zeus in a little bit. But Zeus robs banks, and Zeus is not over. Zeus is now spreading on Android phones, so it's very dangerous. Spyware is a type of malware that originally, when I thought of spyware, I thought of, oh, that's that advertising-supported stuff. You go to a web server, and it just pushes it down. And they made agreements with Norton, Samantha, or anti, uh, you know, McAfee. Don't remove those. Uh, so you'd have to get, like, SpyBot, Search and Destroy, or Adware. But now that class of software is way different. These are anything from Net Nanny, something you want to watch what your kids do. But the worst ones are right here on your phone. The ones where I can have, uh, well, think about it. People do whatever they, they uh, do on their PC on their phone. This has a camera, this has a microphone, and it has a GPS. And you could download a botnet builder. You can go to YouTube and figure out how it works. You could send to your, fun, your friend funny messages and they click on it. And now you got millions of machines infected. And then you go, all right, turn on the cameras and all the microphones at this latitude, longitude, and altitude. Awesome. And together, it's not just one thing. You got an email that contained it. There was a Facebook link. It was blah, blah, blah. And, it's, and it had a virus with a Trojan. Who knows? All right, so just recapping here. Virus has two things. Uh, it has its replication mechanism and its payload, and what's it going to do? Now, I don't see stoned anymore. I don't see the form. I don't see Michelangelo. They're contained in zoos, but Zeus is in the wild. All right, so that's the difference between a, uh, a zoo specimen and a, in the wild. Um, those boot sector viruses didn't just infect the boot sector. They in, uh, uh, infected the, the uh, file system as well. They had multiple parts, so you might see that as multi-partite or partite. Um, but viruses don't want to be detected. We detect them because they have a line of code, the signature. We compress the virus. Maybe you, you, you uh, detect it because it, it got bigger. Word.exe is a meg longer. I can compress it and just elude that type of detection. Or maybe in your program code, there were places that didn't really do anything. There were just like spaces there. Uh, and I can embed my virus there. It won't take up uh, any larger space. And that's the very testable cavity virus. Um, wow, why don't I take a, a, a concept that we know from encryption, a way to protect my, my own communication, I could generate a nonce, and then I can XOR that, and we're going to know how that works a little bit better in crypto, uh, but I can XOR my signature with that nonce, and every time the virus executes, it does this. There is just no way that I know of to pick up that virus using signature detection. That is known as polymorphic. It will continue to change. Poly, multiple, morphic, change. Come from the Greek. Um, if every time this virus runs, like so every time I hit the corrupted word exe, it goes out and scans the network, it's going to be very obvious. So what virus uh, vendor or authors often do is don't do that. Wait a while maybe every 30th of the month or something like that. And that will be known as the very testable sparse infector virus. Worms are network aware. They produce on their own self-contained code. Like I mentioned, SQL Slammer just blew me away when you see the stats. Most of the damage was done in 10 minutes. The entire world was infected in 10 minutes. Um, they were polymorphic as well. 
blended attacks. Again, they could be, it starts out as a, uh, a Facebook game. The next thing you know, it's going into your, your Outlook client and mailing itself to other people. The logic bomb. It, uh, when a certain uh, event happens, so Michelangelo, Chernobyl, and these are the things that worry me. Because if I want to take over the world and I was building your computers, I don't know that the malware would run all the time. It would either wait for a port knock or it would wait for some special date. The Trojan horse, again, I want you to run the, the virus, but it's not going to be called evil software. It's going to be called whatever, um, uh, for, as a guitar guy, I'm a sucker for free chords. Uh, or I might have, a, it's a guitar tuner. Actually, as a Star Trek guy, I got really, someone showed me a tricorder for Android. When I looked at Tricorder app, it wanted full access to my SD RAM card, my network card, my phone state and identity, my GPS, and I was like, why? But it would be a great way to get a nerd like me to do it, right? Um, some of these things are sold as remote administration tools or remote access tools. Uh, I love this one, and it's really powerful. Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy. Oops and is a rat builder, but when they say rat, remote administration tool. No, it's a Trojan. Now you could build a lot of really bad malware with it. You could build a botnet with it, but how do I get you to run the botnet? Well, I told you, you're gonna pick a legitimate program. And uh, one of my buddies, uh, Ralph H. Mendia, showed me a one neat technique. He said, um, just go to LimeWire, see what the number one download of the day is. And this one day, it was pretty funny, it was Norton Antivirus, nav.exe, and he goes, what kind of guy? Now, how sophisticated is the user who thinks you can get a working, functioning Norton antivirus off of LimeWire? So he takes it. He takes a uh, what's known as a wrapper. And that's going to be very important to you on your test. The wrapper binds the Trojan to the legitimate, in this case, nav.exe. Now, you didn't upload it. He said, how hard would that be? And people will now start clicking it. So really easy to deploy these things. All right. Spyware, again, old school, you know, drive-by download thing just to track what you're doing. But now it's a full set of spy tools. They turn on your camera. They turn on your microphone. They can access your file system. They work on your cell phone. Who builds our machines? Where are they mostly built? And I don't want to just pick on Chinese. I certainly am not picking on Chinese people, but we see a lot of it in the news today about China hacks. Um, and I, you'll find me on YouTube as far back as 2006, 2007, a warning that this is uh, very likely going on. And they built uh, ARC systems and they have cameras built into it. And they actually put in the ability to do that um, so they could turn on your camera without letting you know. And they were caught doing it in some cases. And in many cases, it was uh, infiltrated high value uh, political, economic, and media locations in over 103 countries. So pretty scary stuff. And again, now they're networked. Zeus robs banks. Uh, Configure, what a lesson in patch management. We talked about zero day. Well, Configure took advantage of a Microsoft vulnerability that had been patched, I believe, eight months earlier. Microsoft had the patch. The exploit didn't come out for eight months, but most people didn't patch their systems. And at the height, I'd seen something like uh, eight million. I don't know where they are now. Let's take a quick look. Con Thicker. Uh, let's see if we have a uh, status of it. I don't, don't want to be too, too much time. But it generally hovers uh, in the millions. Um, now, one of the big challenges with this is we know the replication mechanism. We don't know what the payload is. Some people argue it's broken. Some people said it was hijacked. Maybe it was laying there waiting for phase two. I don't know. Uh, Bredo Lab, amazing. 30 million machines. Sun Tzu says in The Art of War, it takes 100,000 men to wage a war. 30 million machines. Um, it's hard to find them. The, the best you can do is look at traffic and see who they're talking to. They encrypt the traffic, just as we like to encrypt our stuff, they do. But if I can't hear who you're calling, I listen to your phone call and I can't hear, but I watch who you're calling, and you're calling arms dealers, I can infer that you're involved in arms. So as soon as traffic analysis, it seems to be the only way we're going to get these. Um, and now the uh, Android botnets, uh, I just looked at earlier today, they said there's at least 8,000 uh, known um, variants of Zeus. 8,000 8, variants on non-Google apps. So you go to your app store and you want to download something that's not from Google, good luck on it. 
All right. Um, I did mention that when I first saw these things, they were used for denial of service attacks. So this is, look at this denial of service attack. And I don't want to name the guy. Anybody who's familiar with the attack, this was actually a very famous story in, in, um, in Internet history. This actually happened in 2005. But we'll leave the guy alone. I don't, he seems to be a, a very smart, intelligent person. Just might have made a mistake. Um, getting on an IRC channel was the rumor uh, with some hackers. And they were talking about their botnets. And he said, well, he could stop them. That they, you know, they were script kiddies. And they didn't know what a real pro could do. Well, apparently he wasn't quite right. Now... The infected zombies were any machine that could have clicked on the funny link. The masters are IRC systems distributed through the world and just waiting for the attacker to say go. And what they really did, and I don't know the, um, the full extent because I don't think they've actually told us what they did to the routers, but they were able to get the core routers on the internet to amplify the attacks. These are like drinking from a fire hose. The core routers have the fastest pipes. They brought down his ISP, Vario, for four hours. And uh, I'm only going to guess, I, I think I mentioned earlier in our scanning about DSCP or type, excuse me, quality of service type of service, Cisco calls it. Well, routers are supposed to have the highest um, a priority of any traffic. And that's known as uh, class selector 6 uh, or DSCP value 48. And if I set that on my denial of service attack, the routers, if they respect that, are going to go, oh, we have to process this above all else. Uh, whatever the case was, this is, you won't see this on a test, but you notice this is DR, DOS. This is a distributed, reflected denial of service using the core routers of reflectors, and uh, this is really bad. There's no defense. How easy is it to create it? I said, just download a free tool like Poison Ivy, go to YouTube, and I just looked today, and got all kinds of Poison Ivy set up. Yeah, 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 it's real easy. So, it's not hard at all. Well, I say the best defense is just don't start trouble with people trying not to make yourself an enemy. If, you're, if you don't do that, you're not guaranteed safety. Of course, there's always people who resort to crime for whatever reason. But if I start trouble with somebody else, I have people who are not going to resort to crime who still want to hurt me. So I try to just be cool. All right, that's uh, the system hacking. Keep in mind, again, the uh, context. We have now really completed the entire phases of hacking. We did our passive reconnaissance, our active reconnaissance, scanning for live IPs, port numbers and services, vulnerabilities. We just exploited some vulnerabilities. In this case, we exploited password vulnerabilities. But the rest of the uh, class is just about other exploits. So at this point, we have completed the phases of hacking. All right, thank you very much. Now we hope you've enjoyed this free module, but there's lots more. The Cyber Kung Fu course has 29 videos in all and will really help build you a solid understanding of the CEH version 8 curriculum. Don't forget, if you prefer to attend one of the Secure Ninja's courses in person at any of our training locations, you really need to visit secureninja.com specials for some amazing discounts and other deals. I'm Alicia Webb, happy training. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.